All right, here we go, folks. This is the very raw reaction to Western Derby 53. Did literally no planning for this video, so I'm just gonna talk off the noggin um, and and basically see what see what comes out. For uh, if you're watching the live stream, which a lot of you did, appreciate that. Um, you would have seen all the emotions of what was a very very disappointing Derby performance by the West Coast Eagles going down by 15 points, I think it was in the end, to Fremantle and. You know, I am in some ways a little bit gutted. I do think I thought it would hurt worse than this, though. I think I thought it was going to feel worse if we lost this derby. And I honestly don't know if that's because the game appeared to be over at quarter time. It was eight goals to three at quarter time. Eight goals to 50 in a quarter. I don't know how many times anyone's breached 50 points in a quarter this year. And West Coast allowed Fremantle to do that. Now, Fremantle played really, really well. To be honest, I don't think I've seen Fremantle play that well probably in, well, since their last Derby win. It was 2015. That was when Fremantle was last, you know, a very good team. I don't think I've seen them torture side like that. I could be wrong. <sighs> Conceding eight goals against a team that's renowned for its lack of, you know, genuine scoring power. You know, Matt Tappen is a handy player. Josh Tracy looks like a good young up-and-coming forward, but... Without Fife, without um, Brayshaw, you know, there, <laughs> there was a lot of reasons why Fremantle were not going to show up to this game. And early on, it appeared to be a lot of energy in it. Like the first derby, there seemed to be sort of a lot of um, end-to-end -end football. Not not necessarily good skills, but uh, by contrast to a normal West Coast or Fremantle game, the bad skills were caused by a finals-like intensity rather than, you know, just you know poor skills. And I'm really only talking about the first quarter because after the quarter time, the game in general just descended. Um, Fremantle really took their foot off the pedal, um, but the Eagles didn't make up any ground in the second term, and at halftime, the margin was still five goals. In the third term, we swamped them. I think at one point, it was like 22 inside, 50s to five for the quarter, um, but we only reduced the, the margin by five, uh, two goals, rather, so still tried by 18, and it was just a story of there were at times throughout the game where Fremantle were giving us the game on the platter. They were, and we couldn't capitalize. And at the end of the day, Fremantle deserved to win. They were the better team, I believe. You know, even though if, if you look at the stats, we we dominated inside fifties, but it was kind of a case of uh, inside fifties were so poor, and they were so good on you know the counter attacks. I think back to that Travis Collier intercept in the middle of the ground, or not intercept, but gather in the center of the ground, kick a goal. We, we didn't really look as threatening as that at any point throughout the game, um, and it just felt you know the whole time that Fremantle were in control. I did have faith we'd come back a little bit, but uh, ultimately just left our run too late. Well, maybe not the run too late, but more so that the margin simply got too big, you know, for us to contain. And for a side that's with the list profile that the Eagles have got at the moment, uh, with so many stars and, you know, the injury list has been an issue at times this year, but we had a very strong 22 on the field to look that meek. That's a real concern. And now that becomes six of our last eight games we've lost by an average margin of around about the 40 mark, I think. And, you know, with Brisbane next week, genuinely think that could be in excess of 70, 80 point win to Brisbane. I'm not even just saying that pessimistically. That could be a serious belting. When I say that Fremantle were sort of were giving us the game on the platter, I think even their fans would admit that. They, they, they really sort of stopped for a good quarter and a half there. And, like, I'm not disrespecting the way they played because ultimately they, they pretty much won the game in uh, the second half of the first quarter and then put the queue in the rack. They could be forgiven. When you look at the 22 that were listed out for either side, the Eagles was much more experienced. You know, we would have had probably over half a dozen All-Australians playing in that team today. When you factor in that, you know, Fremantle were rightfully probably considered underdogs with two of their better players out, um, and they were clearly the better side. I think comparing to, you know, previous Derby losses, um, and it has been a while, <laughs> but going back to like, you know, the, that 2006 era, or even, you know, in the early mid 2010s, uh, when Fremantle started to come up, there was the sense of like, I would want to argue really vehemently around losing the derby and be like, nah, we're actually pretty good, eh? We're like, well, we actually should be better than this. But I think it's, I've just reached an acceptance that we are just in an absolute hole at the moment. Like, there, there can't really be too much uh, argument against the fact that the Eagles are in serious, serious trouble. Now, the issues have been well documented. I, I've been as hard on the Eagles as many in the media, um, I'd, I think. I know they went pretty hard us on the couch, but, you know, it was all justified. But I've also still maintained that on talent, we should be a top six club and that's where we've been for the last four years in fact uh in fact no in the last six years we've 
um, we've may have finished in the top six or have won a final. So the the premise that the Eagles have an extremely talented list, um, you know, won the flag and then added guys like Tim Kelly um, and Nat Nui and Gaff sort of came back into that side after not playing in that grand final, including Shepard. There's a very strong argument that the Eagles have one of the more talented lists in the comp. So why is it at the moment that they are currently probably second or third worst team in the comp on form? I did my power rankings a few weeks ago and I had us ninth and um, that's just made me look a bit silly because we, you know, we have more data on them now and there is no case to be made in my opinion that on form that we are better than, we're certainly not better than Hawthorne, um, probably on the Gold Coast and Adelaide level. Collingwood are in that mix as well, but they beat us by 45 points. So, I mean, how can you really rationalize that on current form we're better than them? And it's an awkward point in the season to realize this because obviously with our good start to the year where we were six and three with you know, considerable injuries, way more injuries than now. The fact that we are one of the worst sides in the competition, genuinely, they cannot be dis disputed now. We are still probably not going to get a top 10 pick after the Father Son Academy pick. So I don't know what our current pick is. It's probably around the 10 mark. We're still not going to get one. So the value of us, you know, <laughs> going to shit this year, there's not a whole lot of upside. The funny thing is like, I think with 10 wins in most other years, you sort of finish around that 13th or 14th mark. And that's just about what we deserve, to be honest. It is, it's really, really frustrating. And I, I do cringe a little bit when, you know, you we, as fans, we criticize the heart and endeavor and courage of players. But, you know, at the end of the day, we just watch from the couch and these guys actually put their bodies on the line. But I think it's fair to say that the commitment of the Eagles at the moment is just as low as it's ever been. And I think we're starting to really resemble that late John Worsfold era um, where the Eagles were, you know, one of the premiership favorites going to 2013, finished 13th and, uh, and further that ended the season with some of the worst beltings that, you know, the club has ever endured. I've been optimistic that, you know, we can turn it around. Like the, the nucleus of talent is still good, uh, more so in the in the prime age players. Like guys like Yo and Kelly and McGovern, like these guys, or Gaff even, these guys aren't really close to retirement. Like they're still in their prime. I mean, they might be at the back end of that prime, but there's no, I don't find it a compelling argument the Eagles are declining because of age. When you look at the two oldest on the list, Kennedy and Hearn have probably been two of the better senior players we've had this year, uh, which is just odd, especially when you have to consider, you know, do we give Kennedy and Hearn more, more years on their contract. I'm kind of torn because they have been two of the better performing senior players uh, for extended periods this year, in particular Hearn. But just getting back to that point, like I, as optimistic as I have been in for the future about you know how teams can be in contention, drop drop off, and then come back and still be in contention. There has been evidence of that in the past, but off the top of my head. Don't recall too many teams that were this bad and came back into premiership contention. I think this is really, really concerning. I generally thought, you know, with pride and ego on the line, the Eagles would snap out of it. The, the last 10 minutes against Melbourne showed what we could do. We would have got a bit of confidence back and playing against a team we generally play well against, we were just, you know, uncompetitive for parts of that game. There is some sort of rot going on in the Eagles. I, I think... You can, I mean, we've had injuries this year, but they're not really to blame for the form. In fact, our injuries have fluctuated around our form. So we're playing better when we get more injuries. And I'm, I'm sure players are probably coming in underdone. Like, Shui doesn't look quite fit. Um, you know, McGovern definitely hasn't looked fit this year, but it's definitely a lot deeper than that. Now, I've made videos in the past about, you know, the system being poor, confidence is obviously low, but I just generally wonder if with the team this talented, they should have more pride in the way they play. Because I'm not seeing it, to be honest. I think we can all agree in that. Do we just have a content playing group that's won their premiership and don't have the same hunger to go around again and compete for another one? That's genuinely possible. You know, football and sport in general is a very mental game. Have these players just lost that hunger? Because it's a tight competition. You don't have to be that far off with your hunger and endeavor to fall way behind the pack. And like effort is unquestionably a massive problem for us right now. Anyway, don't know how much more there is to say about the performance. Like Fremantle were fantastic. Caleb Tarong is an absolute superstar, absolute jet. Two goals, 32 possessions. Kick probably goal of the year. You know, I'm I'm kind of glad in hindsight it wasn't disallowed because the ball, you know, the ball did go out of bounds. But with the fact that it didn't impact the game, you know, Fremantle won either way. Uh, I'm, I, that, that should be goal of the year in my eyes. That was fantastic. For me, I think it was kind of an important win for them to sort of showcase to a guy like Adam Chera who's considering his options, you know, do you really want to go home and play Victoria or do you now sort of believe a little bit what we've got cooking is actually half decent? And you look at that young free man on midfield, Sean Darcy tapping it under Brayshaw, um, Chera and Sarong. And then you've got, you know, guys like Hayden Young in that team as well. From a playing 
perspective and, you know, in terms of sticking around at a team that might be playing finals in a few years, I, I think there's a strong case for Adam Chera to, to stick around at Fremantle. Maybe he signs a two-year deal. I don't know. But, you know, in a weird, twisted way, I kind of... It was almost nice to see the moment when the siren went and the crowd erupted. And it looked... It literally, if you didn't have any context, you'd think, you know, this team has just qualified for a grand final. The players all lifted. Um, the crowd lifted out of their seats. You can just imagine the atmosphere was electric. And in a strange way, I actually found it in my heart... To, uh, to feel good for Fremantle fans, like they do, they do cop it. There's been a long period without success, and I, I don't think they're going to play finals this year. Nor do I think they they're good enough to play finals just yet. But I've also said, you know, of the group that's competing for finals this year, out of that glut of four or five teams, GWS, West Coast, um, Richmond, St Kilda, I'd imagine Fremantle are also the youngest team out of that group. So there's no shame in that, um, and I think it, I think it's a really important win. And as much as it sucks to lose a derby, I could kind of see the beauty in that moment of Fremantle winning that derby and how much it meant to them. Um, and I kind of also think from a West Coast perspective, it's probably, I think we can grow from this loss in terms of really seeing where things are at right now. Fremantle played with spirit. I think we saw flashes of their talent, um, some absolute young guns on that team. I'm very jealous of their young midfield, but this game was there for the taking and we weren't good enough to take it. And, you know, where, where to for the Eagles? I mean, I, I think I said a, a comment in the stream, like, if we lose this, I could see Simpson doing the dramatic step of dropping Petricelli for Hutchings. <laughs> like, it's kind of been the tale of our selection policy this year. And at times I defended it. You know, we've had injuries. Um, but at other times you think you've been very protective of your senior players this year, Simo, in the match committee. Um, you haven't really dropped anyone of note to be honest, and that's all well and good when they, you know, repay the faith and they come into form, but now in hindsight, what was the benefit of that? That was just a poor strategy in hindsight because we missed out on getting some games into guys who were willing to to really put in a really good effort for the club, and I think we're almost certain to lose a guy like Jared Brando, who's been fit in the waffle the last couple of weeks, almost certainly going to request a trade home to Victoria, um, and may, that may or may not be a byproduct of us not playing him, but you know, Hutchings playing games in the last part of this season, Vardy, like, come on. <laughs> I think it's also a signal of the fact that maybe we're just looking at the waffle and thinking the players we got to bring in are actually no good. And look, maybe that's a byproduct of, you know, the Tim Kelly trade. We did trade out of two years of drafts. I, I think that gets magnified uh, maybe a little bit too much. Um, I think the fact that we have no midfield talent is probably an issue of not taking a first round pick on a midfielder since 2013. Um, and I'm praying that this is the year that changes. But I mean, like Simo's not going to give the media what they want. He's going to act like this is not a big deal. Uh, but I'm sure internally, I'm sure that he is going to see that where we're at now is just trending one way. And that's, you know, potentially bottom four next year. So what do the Eagles do? Look, I, I've i wanted Kennedy and Hearn to play on, but I, I think we're reaching the point where it's probably just delusional to think, you know, these guys are going to help us play on um, and, you know, pinch a flag in the next two years. I think... I don't believe in a full rebuild as such. I don't think I don't think any club should really do that in that kind of way where they really bottom out. If you can avoid it, I prefer not to. So, but I think we can, you know, spend a couple of years investing in the draft. But you know, playing Kennedy next year over an Oscar Allen full time in that role, or a Bailey Williams in the ruck, playing Shannon Hearn when we've got you know Alex Witherden and um, Josh Rotham. I thought Witherden was pretty good today. It's time to expose that sort of next layer. Um, and push for that improvement because, you know, like I said, this is only trending one way. Jack Redden's out of contract. You know, he's been fantastic this year, but, you know, with a team as on the steep decline as we are, is there an argument to say, hey, Redden, thanks for your service, but well, you're not what the club needs right now? I'm not saying that's necessarily what I want, but I think with each passing week, that's becoming more and more possible. And we need to we need to make list cuts because we have shorter list sizes in 2021 um, as we did last year. So if we're going to take a minimum of five picks in the draft, which I think we need to, you're probably going to need you know Kennedy and Hearn retiring on top of you know Ainsworth being delisted. Maybe Brander gets a trade, so that's four players cut. Probably a Xavier O'Neill not really cutting it in the waffle right now. Zach Langdon I think was a very strange trade target in hindsight. Uh, clearly not quite up to the standard. But then some of these other guys that, you know, natural listings, Archie, Hutchings, um, Venables has retired. These guys are already on the rookie list. So long story short, I think we're going to perhaps see a, a, an intriguing off season where we don't know what sort of players will actually survive the cut in the same way, you know, Lewis Jetta didn't survive last year. I think we could see a little bit more of that this year.
But anyway, that is my response. That's my rant, my completely unscripted rant on the Eagles' loss to Fremantle. It sucks. Um, but to the credit of people, um, you know, Drews has actually been fairly good about it so far. <laughs> um, he's gone easy on me. But then again, we do film the Drew Footy Show tomorrow, so who knows exactly how that's going to turn out. And, and fair play to Freo. I think I think some people in the East are probably sleeping on them a little bit. Not quite a finals-level opponent just yet, but some of their youth, I think I think they're underrated a little bit, as much as it pains me to say it. Um, yeah. Now, see, guys, let me know in the comments. Um, I presume a lot of people who watch this will be Eagles fans. Tell me what you do in this offseason. Um, look, we, we can't sack Simo because, you know, people want that, I'm sure. But, you know, he has two or three years left on a contract. It's just not going to happen. The club will stick fat, and it's in our nature to not, you know, trade Jack Darling or trade McGovern. So I, th- I think that's all pretty outlandish. We will be conservative to some extent, but I wouldn't be surprised if we throw up something left field. Um, in, a, in a bid to get more talented youth into the into the list because God knows we need it. But thanks, guys. Let me know what you think. If you're a Freo fan, enjoy the Derby win. We'll get you next year. Like the video if you haven't already, and please subscribe. Thanks, guys. See ya.